Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Climate Finance Workshop. You have made a fantastic choice by walking in this room. This uh, yes. the better, the better workshop, and <laughs> we're excited and informative one. I will say, although I know my colleague in another classroom will say something. Um, so I'm Jane. I'm a second year MBA student lead at the USO Amnesty Club. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Thomas Holcomb. Uh, Thomas is currently the Vice President in Marathon Capital. I had a pleasure of working with Thomas over this past summer internship on an energy transition initiative where I got, I got exposed to numerous exciting activities that are happening in uh, molecule markets. Uh, today, Thomas is here to share with us his wealth of knowledge on renewable fuels markets and the exciting energy transition to low carbon molecules. Please join me in welcoming Thomas. Thank you, everyone. Uh, glad to be here today. We want this to be interactive, so please, throughout, feel free to ask questions. Uh, we'll probably also have some time for questions at the end, but whatever is easy. Definitely want this to be interactive and engaging experience. Uh, thank you, Jen, for the invitation and for Yale for hosting. Um, as Jen said, uh, my name is Thomas Holcomb. I'm a vice president of Marathon Capital. I spent the first 15 years of my career in traditional energy 1.0. Actually, was a roughneck in the oil field coming right out of grad school. Worked around Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, did some offshore work as well before getting into corporate development and finance roles for a gas compression company before making my way to Kinder Morgan. Spent the last 10 years of my career at Kinder Morgan where I was doing corporate development and finance for them. Uh, but most topical for today and, and kind of what led me here to be speaking to you all is in 2020, Kinder Morgan decided they would create a fifth business unit called Energy Transition Ventures. This effectively was a private equity group within Kinder Morgan. Uh, more or less, the mandate was to figure out ways for Kinder to deploy, deploy capital in and around the transition space. For those of you who are familiar with Kinder Morgan, it's a pipeline company, which means they do not own or take molecular exposure. They do not take commodity risk. They are a fee-for-service provider in terms of uh, a toll that you would experience on the highway. What was very unique about Kinder Morgan creating this opportunity in this team was that we were given the opportunity to look at actually owning molecular generation. So we had an equity participation and equity stakes in, in actually the molecular generation and commodities itself. The reason that's really important when you think about the energy transition is because that is where the deals are being done. That is where the activity is, is actually generating the energy today and utilizing the existing infrastructure. So from that, in that role, was fortunate enough to help Kinder deploy right at $1.3 billion into the renewable natural gas space. Also spent a lot of time looking at the broader renewable fuel se sector and then also CCS. Uh, specifically, Kinder Morgan um, already is the largest transporter of CO2 in North America, and they were looking at methods to utilize their existing infrastructure to participate in the transportation sequestration of CO2 solutions. Then last year, I decided to join Marathon Capital. Marathon Capital, as some of you might know, is an investment bank. It started 24 years ago, focusing on solar. The, the original founder is still the CEO today, and the impetus for Marathon Capital was just that. Back in 1998, when solar and wind originally started getting a lot of interest at the federal level from incentives, this founder, Ted Brandt, saw a need to help individual, small-scale developers raise capital. And that was the impetus for Marathon Capital. Since then, Marathon Capital has grown with the energy. A lot of these individual developers became platforms. Platforms became sellers. These sellers became utility scales that you know today, such as Nextair and others. Over the course of Marathon's history, the firm decided to evolve, and is what makes Marathon, you know, my opinion and the firm's opinion, a very unique investment bank. Yes, we offer traditional investment banking services and products that, that all of you would know. On top of that, we have an off-take platform along with the tax equity platform. Specifically within the off-take platform, we have a team that is dedicated at actually placing molecules and electrons to buyers. So what this really means so we have a large number of corporate off-takers, uh, one which is public I can talk about is Nestle. So all of Nestle's scope two reductions for actually having them deploy over $600 million into the solar space to generate VPPAs and RECs and the like, and to bring down that scope two reduction is a strategy led by Marathon. On top of that, we have a tax equity department. The reason that that's very important is, as you all know, a lot of the value that is currently in place today within the energy transition space is in the form of a tax credit. This is not new to, to the molecules of the IRA. This tax equity market has been around for over 10 or 15 years now at this point, predicated on the solar and wind space. So again, about eight years ago, Marathon saw a need for this and started to develop a tax equity partner. 
Since then, the Tax Equity Group at the Marathon has helped deploy $6 billion of tax equity solutions to support and underpin development assets. The reason I bring up all of this, and we, you'll see here if we talk about renewable fuels, is that's all part of the secret sauce. It's trying to understand the offtake, it's understanding the way to monetize the tax credits, and also bringing financial solutions. So, just kind of went over a high level of the firm. Uh, just a little bit more about that. We are a global firm. We have operations uh, here throughout North America, headquartered in Chicago, offices in New York. I'm in Houston. I'm also in San Francisco and London. On top of that, we have cover manager, cover, uh, excuse me, country cover coverage managers in Brazil, Spain, and Canada, and then also in uh, Japan as well. So we view ourselves as a global investment bank. We have over 160 employees, 100 of which are banking professionals. So by that standard, we are the largest energy transition bank in the world that we know of. While other large banks have dedicated teams who look at energy transition, our entire firm is dedicated to energy transition. So as a result of everything I just talked about, Marathon decided to create a renewable fuels practice a few years ago and really have a dedicated focus into this space. That was part of the reason they started the Houston office and why I joined the firm at the end of last year. Part of what Marathon is trying to do, what we're going to talk about today here, is become a technical expert in the space of renewable fuels. Renewable fuels feels very foreign to a lot of people, but at the end of the day, it is very, very similar to traditional oil and gas. A lot of the commercial issues that are trying to be solved for have already been solved for. A lot of the logistical challenges and interconnect issues that need to be, to be appropriated, uh, appropriated for risk have already been de-risked by the oil and gas industry. There's a lot that can be learned in terms of Energy 1.0 when you think about applying it to Energy 2.0. So from that, Marathon really has started to look at renewable fuels. Myself and about five other senior bankers in North America are looking only at molecules. So I'm very sorry to disappoint. If you have any electron questions, I know absolutely nothing. Um, except the fact that electricity can kill you and that you shouldn't mess with it. So from that, though, really what we want to talk about today is renewable fuels. Happy to get into tons of gory details. Uh, spend entirely too much time in this space over the last three and a half years of my career. But effectively, renewable fuels, when we talk about this, is defined by the IEA as a liquid fuel that is derived from biomass that is a replacement to a fossil fuel equivalent. The reason that this is so important is right here, is the fact that it is molecularly identical, therefore it is known as a drop-in replacement. I cannot stress this enough. Biodiesel, which has been around for a long time, is not molecularly identical. It has a blend wall, just like ethanol. Both of these have blend walls. Renewable fuels, by definition, do not have a blend wall. Why is this really important? This is critical when you think about the ability to leverage existing infrastructures in place. As we go through some of the financing, some of the case studies later to think about, this is the reason that renewable fuels continues to have massive investments from both financials and strategic companies for the last 24 months. So as you think about renewable fuels, the most common things that come to mind are renewable natural gas, also known as RNG, renewable diesel, known as RD, sustainable aviation fuel, commonly referred to as SAF, then also hydrogen. Hydrogen ends up being in its own unique little bucket. While it is a renewable fuel by definition, it has some additional challenges due to the fact that it cannot utilize existing infrastructures in place today throughout the world. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So as you think about the market, it's a high-level overview. You see here on the bottom left, these are projections from BNF that actually show the growth across the main renewable fuels verticals, renewable diesel, SAF, renewable NAFTA, others. What's really important, though, about this is when we think about the growth of renewable fuels, a lot of people instantaneously go to something that's called RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard, which is a program that was implemented by the EPA in 2006. RFS created what was called the RBO, which is the Renewable Volume Obligation. For those of you who have been in and around the space, that is what actually is the framework for the RINs, Renewable Identification Number. For those of you who just are, are uh, maybe not as initiated into renewable fuels, the RFS and the RBO is what resulted in the ethanol blending that you see when you fill up your, your car if you go to a gas station. That 10% blend is the product of the RFS and the RBO standard. So renewable fuels originally started out as a transportation solution, and it still is very important for transportation. We're going to talk about that a lot. But the other thing that is driving this massive growth is the voluntary market. When I say the voluntary market, I mean industrial players, and I mean public utilities, 
and other organizations who are looking to offset the current consumption of hydrocarbons with renewable products. Now, let's go back to the last slide I want to talk about and think through this. Why would these companies be so focused on renewable fuels? And why do they see this as their future for their decarb effort? Well, it goes back to the fact that because it's molecularly identical, they can use the same infrastructure. A lot of people think that automatically just means pipelines, and yes, it does. But let's take that down all the way through the life cycle of energy. Not only can you utilize the same transmission lines, the same inter- and intrastate pipelines for renewable natural gas or renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel, you can use the same rail cars, you can use the same trucks, you can use the same racks, you can use the same docks for importing and exporting. Yes, take it past that. You can use the same boilers, you can use the same combustors, you can use all the same heating elements, the dryers that are used for corn, you can use the same dryers that are used for paint. Everything that is utilized in industrial applications today that runs on diesel, runs on that gas, can run on renewable natural gas or renewable diesel. So, let's think about that even a little bit further from a financial and economic impact. What does that mean? If you can utilize a fuel without changing out your infrastructure, what does that mean to you financially? Any thoughts? Uh. <laughs> cheaper. Correct. But what it really means is you don't have to deploy capital to replace that infrastructure. That is critical for companies. Companies every day are faced with a decision of how to manage their cash and where to deploy capital. And if any of us were running an organization, or even as a shareholder, we would much rather have our capital and our dollars go to work in growing our business, and bringing on new product lines, on making things more efficient, increasing our margin, all of these things that help make business successful. So by having an option that is available that means you do not have to deploy capital to retrofit, to change out your equipment to full electrification, for example. Not only does that save capital, but also it saves time and training. But that really is an important consideration when you think about your BMWs, your Mercedes, your Nestle's, your Nice Sources, your Northwest Naturals. A lot of these large utilities and these large industrial operators that you know of throughout America are looking to renewable diesel and renewable natural gas just for that reason. Yes, it increases their OPEX and it eats into the margins, but when you think about it in the scale of things, if natural gas makes up 20% of your OPEX for a BMW plant, approximately, if you were to increase that natural gas cost by 30%, you're really only talking about a 3 to 4% increase on your total OPEX across your portfolio, which, quite frankly, is easier to pass along to your consumers by, by stating that you've made carbon reductions and greened up your product, as opposed to the alternative of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of capital that would be deployed to retrofit the assets. So as we think about financing, not only in terms of actually what is driving the demand for these molecules, because we get into some of these cases later on and we think about the decisions that are being made by equity investors, by debt investors, and by large banks on a multinational basis, these are the factors of why a lot of them are leading into renewable fuels in such a meaningful way. Because it's not just about the value for a DCAR, it's about the, the fact that it's actionable and it's available today, and it's something that the actual consumers, us, can utilize, yes, but more importantly, it has massive applications for industrial consumption. Any questions there before we go on? Yes, sir. I have a couple. Um, I was looking at the curve here, our curve. Um, I see it flattening for the next three years. And my question is how does that affect your business? Second, um, how does the pricing uh, renewable fuels compare to um, to other fuels? Good question. So first and foremost, a lot of the reason this is flattening here, when you look at it, is actually going to be due to limited availability of feedstock. And so there's effectively going to be a step mechanism that occurs. As you consume all the feedstock, let me actually answer the question in a way. Think about it as a base load for traditional power. I think about it as your hydro plants being your true base load, and then coal being the cheapest, then natural gas load, and so on. This represents the first tranche of the base load effect of renewable fuels that will be the cheapest to deploy and the cheapest to develop. And once that feedstock is utilized, 
We'll have to look at a stair step effect for new technology and new solutions and new feedstock. So that's part of that reason. Then to your second question. Wait, how does that affect your business? How does it affect the business? From our standpoint, we don't see any concerns. And, and from the actual consumer standpoint, you think about the overall volume that's shown here just through 2027. This is almost a what? A five-fold increase from where we were in 2022. And quite frankly, uh, the projections in 2022 were probably overstated from what actually came online. And then as you think about this also, this does not assume that any of the new technology that's being developed today that is economic within this window. So all you need is one domino to fall for new tech to come on. What I really mean by that is gasification. Gasification's hard, as, as you probably know. Um, you know, and thinking through that, or even e-fuels. Like e-fuels, for example, would be outside of this time horizon before it would come back on. To answer your question directly about the cost, it varies widely. Right? Natural gas today is trading, what, sub $3 per MMBTU? That is actually how renewable natural gas trades. The value of that molecule, the heating element, trades a parity with Henry Hub or, or any other location. But it's the associated attributes that you generate, be it a RIN or an LCFS. But I think what you're really getting at, which is where we're going to go here in a second, is the voluntary market. What are consumers willing to pay on a voluntary basis that is not predicated on a regulatory incentive? And the answer to that is it depends. It depends on your CI score. Right now, landfill RNG, which has a carbon intensity of approximately 40 to 50, so it's about a 60 to 50 percent reduction to its geologic counterpart, is entering into long-term contracts for the attribute. Think of it as a REC or carbon offset. And actually, carbon offset maybe is not the best example, since uh, this is definitely a little bit more known. But the, the value of the carbon savings is trading anywhere between $17 to $20 per MMBTU. <coughs> on long-term contracts, 10 plus years, and then plus the value of the molecules typically trading at, at index, right? That's for landfill. We have clients who are looking to procure negative CI, renewable natural gas, via the form of dairy. So let's just say negative 250 for point of conversation. They're willing to pay upwards of over $50 per MMBTU. And this is actually a great question in a segue. Why is that? Because that is a massive premium compared to three dollars per MMBTU. And the answer is this is because it's a dollar per CO two equivalent basis. If you look at fifty dollars per MMBTU, you convert that to a dollar of CO two equivalent. That ends up being somewhere around three hundred and fifty to four hundred dollars per CO two, depending on exactly how you calculate. If you compare that to your alternatives, of a BMW, a Mercedes, a Nestle. That is much cheaper than DAC. That is much cheaper than hydrogen. Much cheaper than any of the other alternatives that face it. So these corporations are going to shift their mindset from thinking about it as a dollar per, per MMBTU, a dollar per unit, and they're translating now to a dollar per CO2. So renewable fuels in that standpoint has a, a pretty significant leg up on a lot of the other solutions that are available. And again, when you think about this all in the context of public stated goals, 2030 is very close. You think about the hydrogen hubs that were just announced. Best case scenario, even publicly, we're talking about those being done by 2028. Realistically, probably 2030. If you have a 2030 commitment, a 25% reduction in your scope one emissions, what is your option? You can't rely on hydrogen. Hopefully it's there. You sign a contract and it comes online in 2029. What if it doesn't? <clears throat> what solution is available to, the, to these consumers of energy? And that's where renewable fuel enters. And that's why renewable fuel, renewable natural gas, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel has gotten so much interest. Just last week, a recent, recent RNG deal was announced by Enbridge, it's a Canadian uh, publicly traded utility. They bought some assets for $1.2 billion. Right? That is one of, of dozens of, of RNG deals that has been done this year. On top of that, renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel is getting billions of investment right now for that exact same reason. Because the airlines have made public commitments to reduction by 2030. The only way to do that is via T-carving fuel. Whether or not there will or will not be an electric or a hydrogen plane at some point is really off the table because it won't be there by 2030. And so these CEOs and these boards are facing with themselves with a decision. 
Do I do nothing and face the court of public opinion? Or do I enter into contracts before my competitors do and the price goes up? And that's actually the most interesting dynamic right now in the voluntary market is we are seeing large consumers in industrial space that are hyper concerned that the demand actually outpaces the supply of 10 and 20 fold, which it does. If you actually believe and think that a lot of these large industrial consumers will look to renewable fuels to hit their 20, 30 goals. So those are the conversations we have with some of our corporate clients. Is, well, I, I don't want to wait two years. I want to sign a 10-year commitment right now. Specifically, a lot of them want to sign a seven-year commitment and then figure out what happens in 2030. So that's all within the mind of what's occurring, which is a massive tailwind for the renewable fuels industry. And something else we haven't talked about that's very important, you also think about other demand pulls, is the energy transition itself. Think about hydrogen. If you've looked at the IRA, the hydrogen credit, 45V, and then also the clean fuels tax credit, 45Z, 45Z in particular incentivizes low CI product. It's the first time in America that we have an actual regulation that is directly related to CI on a federal level besides LCFS, which is state level. Everything else has been binary. You're below X, you get the full value. This is a CI. So if play that out with renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen in particular, ammonia. One of the most impactful ways to reduce your CI score there is yes, CCS, so carbon capture, and technically not even sequestration or utilization for carbon capture and by bringing in renewable natural gas to green up your natural gas stream. So when you think about the demand from RD and SAF facilities as those come online, or when you look toward the hydrogen economy, believing that that will be as large as everyone is predicting it will, I'm not going to opine on exactly when. My personal opinion is maybe a little bit later than everyone thinks. But when you think about that, the scale, the volume that's necessary, the supply is physically unable to keep up. RNG in particular, just putting this all in context, if you developed every single known feedstock source in North America today, dairy, food waste, landfill, e-fuels, gasification, you name it, the most aggressive number is 20% of North America's natural gas. 20%. So that is the quagmire that these companies are facing. And that is honestly compounded with the energy transition, why we believe that the demand for renewable fuels is going to drastically outpace the supply. I think you had a question there, sir. It was concerning the, the supply, actually. Yeah. You, you cannot answer the question. But then my question, my next question will be, then why do that? Why, if there is no supply, but we see that there is just a limited amount of supply for this, why go into that market and not explore other alternatives? What was the last part, I'm sorry? And why go into that specific use, uh, use of renewable fuels versus other alternatives? I, I apologize. I, as I said, I worked on the oil field, so I actually we're hearing it. What was the last part you said? Why not explore other alternatives yeah. to, for the supply versus just looking at renewable fuels? Fair enough. So they are, is the short answer. Economics is, is, the, is the long answer with, with many layers to it of why they haven't gotten there yet. E-fuels is a prime example. Um, and economics is the easy answer. But the, the real answer is, it gets into thermodynamics and energy efficiency, and energy equivalence. And that is all part of this, right? E-fuels is a prime example. Right now that is a net negative in terms of energy that's produced. The amount of energy that goes into a process the amount of energy comes out is a net negative. Yes, it's green. Yes, it's zero carbon by definition. But economically, you consume about 1.3, 1.6 units of energy for every unit you get out. That has a very interesting social consideration. If you think about putting an e-fuels plant and bringing on an extra 500 megawatts of solar power, you say that you're going to take on another 200 megs off of the grid to still just produce 500. So the short answer is economics, but it's really economics that's underpinned in thermodynamics and energy efficiency and yield concepts. But that's where a lot of this new technology is being explored, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, Denmark is doing a lot there with gasification, trying to figure this out and, and break that code. Um, I think we'll get there. It's just a question of, of when, not of if. 
And until then, that is why developers are trying to lock up as much supply as possible. Which is a uh, pretty good segue into this. When we think about the investment community, specifically equity investors, these are the main you know, nine items up here that they are hyper-focused on. When you think about the investment thesis and how myself, my firm, large infrastructure companies, your, your, your alphabet suits, your AIGs, your EIVs, your KKRs, BlackRock, Blackstones, Strategics, Kinder Morgan, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, Nextera, pick anyone. The biggest question is, where do you, have, where do you find your feedstock? And it's the availability of and access to. Price is a distant third. Once you've sold for feedstock and you can show me as a potential investor that you have feedstock secure, my next question is, I want to understand your commercial offtake. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But only once you've answered those two questions, and I understand that there is a good solve for feedstock, there's a commercial viable solution that is bankable, that is an underwritable on the back end, do I even begin to ask you about your technology? Not because tech is important, it's critically important, but you can have the best mousetrap known to man, and if you don't have the ability to access that feedstock and physically to secure it, and guarantee it's coming to your facility, and then have a commercial offtake in place, a physical infrastructure to support that, your mousetrap's worthless. What's your threshold? I'm sorry? What's your threshold on feedstock? Secure before you even looked at it. Good question. Uh, varies widely is the the appropriate answer. Yeah, I mean if you have um, an area, it's easy, right? Yeah. But if you have like a, say a combination food waste and you have ICI in the mix, well ICI is not something that you can just go and no. get like twenty year contracts. No, it's not. So I think it really depends by the sub vertical. Okay. So food waste, for, for example, the first question I would ask if I'm looking at a food waste company is looking to try to make that into the biogas or RNG. Yep. I'd say, all right, well, help me understand how sticky are, are your actual services you're providing. Are you only collecting the food waste, or are you doing the food waste and the sorting? Do you have unique totes that you've provided your customers that they now have to design a logistics solution in-house around? Because if you have a, a special proprietary tote and a way you help them sort that at their site, that you then pick up and you bring to your own sorting facility, and you have a large penetration of trucks, I feel very confident that's probably sticky. I can get there, and I can probably begin to get investors comfortable that you should look at that. Yeah, the amount of people that have like the truck and infrastructure and like the, the packaging. I mean, it's pretty. It's already pretty sectorized. Like it the is. people that collect ICI, like it's already pretty determined. It is. So either like you have like municipal waste that you collect, you know, that you have like say like a transfer station. Yep. And, like the ones generate tax, right? Yep. Uh, okay, so you have that. Okay, I understand. You control that. Mm -hmm. Great. But, you know, what is your threshold on just regular feedstock secured, knowing that this ICI is most likely going to be very variable? 20%, 30%, 50%? Yeah. Um, the, the, the answer is on a mathematical basis. How much do I need to get to a baseline to probably operate my facility at break even? Okay. That's probably the easy answer. That answer becomes a little bit more opaque if you want to bring in debt. That answer then would be opt by, all right, if we're trying to raise X percentage of debt, cover your debt. How much feedstock do we need to be able to cover the cash flow? Okay. Okay. That's how I think about it. Go, go kind of down the permutation from there. Okay. Good question. So we talked a lot about feedstock. We've talked a lot about the offtake. Right? Those are the two most critical components of this. And then it's the mousetrap. So let, let's play all that out from an investment scenario. If we had an opportunity that came our way and we were all looking at together, and we looked at 10 opportunities within the same vertical, and all of those have been doing $7 million a year of, of, of EBITDA of earnings, and all of a sudden, you know, Justin comes and he says he's got this great solution, it's going to be $10 million a year of earnings. That's interesting. All right, well, maybe, maybe he's producing more volumes. You start looking into it, notice the exact same volumetric output. Well, how could that be possible? What's going on? Well, that then leads you down the question of understanding, is it a CI score? Is it a yield score? Is it an efficiency score? Which then gets you the technological question. Which then actually gets you further down the rabbit hole, understanding your EPC, understanding your insurance, understanding your RAPs, 
of understanding your limit liquidating damages that you have. So when you think about all of this, it becomes a multi-dimensional cube. So that's why so many times when you ask investment bankers and investors, you know, VCs, whomever, what's your exact threshold here, hither, hither, and yon, the answer is always, I don't know. I have to look at the multi-dimensional Rubik's cube and I have to play with it, right? Because if, if Justin's solution is predicated on a first-of-a-kind technology that has never been deployed, that doesn't have a pilot project, for all of these economics to happen, I'm going to be pretty nervous, right? Now, if it is a technology that has been utilized in different applications, and he is now simply reconfiguring the mousetrap, and if he has, let's just say for a point of conversation, Honeywell, UOP, doing the EPC work, let's say he has a full liquidated damages, a full wrap, right, where they are on the hook with performance obligations that if that unit does not produce at 95% or higher, they financially make up the difference. Maybe I get pretty comfortable. Kind of like that. As opposed to if he says, well, you know, I actually talked to uh, my cousin who's got a construction company. He's going to do this. He says it's going to be perfect. <laughs> That's just hate that. <laughs> so it all comes back around to this multi-dimensional Rubik's Cube that's shown here. Right? And really, it's all of these. It's understanding your development process, your score, your equipment, your offtake, your EPC, your market, your pricing curves, your efficiency, your production, your volumes. All of those interrelated. What, what market are you accessing? Is it only predicated on being economic if you access the California market? How can you guarantee that your molecule is going to make it to California opposed to someone else's? This California market is a magnet based on CI score. So as soon as I have a CI product slightly lower, I'm going to be able to displace Justice Molecule. If his economics are solely predicated on LCFS, that gives me a lot of risk. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. How much of a role does the transportation distance between production facility and off-taker matter in that calculation? So from a CI standpoint, it's important, but it's not as important as you might think. Right now, I'm going to answer your question multiple phases. Right now, uh, GRE, uh, which is the federal model, and CARB, which is the California model, they all apply the same CI score to, the, to modes, right? So whether or not, uh, 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 by mode. So no matter which pipeline, for example, you took from, let's just say, uh, Texas to California, no matter the route, you get the same score. Same thing with your truck. The only way that you could get a better score on your truck is if you could prove you were using CNG vehicles or a hydrogen vehicle, right? So it's a little generic, which is unfortunate, because then it really does penalize operators and logistics providers who try to be more competitive with their efficiencies than, than, their, than, you know, than their competitors. But really the question is less about economics, because it is de minimis in terms of the scale. I mean, if you think about a, a pipeline move, for example, like you're talking sub a dollar per barrel a lot of times for a tire move from Texas to California. So it's not a lot. The bigger issue is the physical access. That's the bigger concern. So what I really mean by that is this commercial offtake I was talking about. I want to understand the economics, and I want to understand the commercial solution. I want to know if they're investment grade. Who is your buyer, right? Is it someone who has a large balance sheet who I know will be there to continue to buy and pack this 10-year contract, or am I worried about them going bankruptcy? But then also it's what's your physical pathway to get this new molecule to the market. And that's less about to your final market, but it's more about from your plan, from your new facility, to the initial point of interconnect. It's the same problem that solar and wind is struggling with right now with interconnect queues, of, of being too far delayed, and they can't produce revenues until interconnect happens. It's the same concept with molecules. Right? If you put a facility it's in the middle of, I'm just going to pick on Kansas for no, no specific reason besides you used to drive through entirely too much going back to Denver for school. That's very bare. And you have to run a 100-mile pipe from your facility before you can connect into an L, a local distribution line or into an interstate pipeline to get your renewable diesel to market. I don't like that. That is now economics that is going to be burdened on this project. And now also you've, you've entered a new risk which is binary risk that the pipeline project has to get built for your project to be viable. So that's why when you think about renewable fuels, specifically, and these hydrogen hubs, and ammonia hubs, 
and everything's being discussed, they're all co-located, if you notice, around existing critical infrastructure. And that's important for hydrogen in particular. This is a fun question. Does anyone know, a colleague of mine, I can't take credit for this, uh, said this to me a few months ago, and I thought it was perfect. What is the best use for hydrogen? Storage. Industrials. What you say? Best use? What was it? Industrials. Storage. Enhanced okay. storage. Okay. All, all, all good. I would even make it simpler. The best use for hydrogen is hydrogen. Yeah, making more. Replace all of your existing hydrogen with blue or green hydrogen. You can utilize the existing infrastructure. That's why the hydrogen hubs have got greenlit. A lot of their thesis, think about the one in, in Texas, Louisiana, the Northeast, they are around and co-located next to massive consumption points of hydrogen that exist today. So they're talking about building hydrogen facilities that are literally sharing the fence line or right across the Mississippi River from a massive ammonia operation. And they are now going to be able to tap into that and utilize all that existing infrastructure. So that, to me, when you think about the commercial story, yes, it is the contract. Yes, it is the offtake. But also it comes down to something as simple as how are you physically going to get this molecule from the point of generation to the existing network or to your new network that is going to allow your consumer the ability to access it. And, when, and as we talk about this, and we'll go through here in a second, you'll see that concept of binary risk, that's something that absolutely terrifies the investment community. And what I really mean by that is it's known as project on project risk. Um, I always thought about binary risk, and that's something as simple as if this event does not happen, I do not have a solution. Pipelines are a prime example. Uh, CCS, for example, if you were building a, a, a sustainable aviation plan, and it was in North Dakota, and you were relying on the Navigator CO2 pipeline as your solution, they just canceled the pipeline two weeks ago. Now you don't have a C CO2 solution. So you either go ahead with the project, maybe, maybe not, but if you do, your CI score just went up, which means the value of your molecule went down. But more importantly, as you think about this from a true investment universe, the real question that comes in that situation is, if I had entered into a contract and I was going to sell you, David, my renewable fuel from that facility, did you put language in that contract that says there's condition precedence? Do you have to have a CO2 solution in place? Because you want to make sure that you're supporting a production of a, a renewable fuel facility that is not emitting any more incremental CO2? Because if you did, I just breached my contract. Now I don't have offtake. So that's binary on binary risk. So that's risk on risk. So the more layers of this that investors see when they diligent, whether it's equity or debt, the more that they, frankly, get <coughs> scared. And that's typically what kills most investment opportunities. As general anecdote for, for those of you who maybe aren't necessarily directly in, in the investing world on a daily basis. I bet myself and the team and the firm that I'm part of, that I look at anywhere between 75 and 100 opportunities before there's one that we green light that we want to represent in the market. That's how many projects that are out there that haven't solved all the layers of this risk. And it's not because we're hypercritical. We are. But we're hypercritical because we know that our investors are. We're hypercritical because we know if we go to the debt market and we say we want to raise $200 million of debt for this project and you haven't solved for it, banks can look at us and just say no. It's not even a conversation. They have a checklist. Do you have this? And at the bottom, if the tally is greater than what they need, they will continue due diligence. If it's not, that's a lot. Come back to us from your project to de-risk. That's in the conversation. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. What incentivizes all these players to, you know, start projects that are not bank? OPM, <clears throat> other people's money. Um, a, a lot of them, frankly. So that's actually interesting. So it's not always tried and true, but a really good question right out of the gate for a developer to understand how thoughtful the conversation is going to be if you get into the weeds is, who's financing you currently? Who is who's providing your capital for your networking capital? And if the answer is myself and my partner, I probably want to hear a lot more. If the answer is 
oh, well, we got $5 million from a VC firm. I, I'm not saying I'm not interested, but all of a sudden now, that risk isn't really worn by the developer. So the short answer is, it just depends. A lot of them do have very good ideas. A lot of them, frankly, and, and not saying this to be negative, there's a lot of bad commentary in the market. A lot of people in the investment community will, will try to say, yes, this deal will work. Yes, we will be there. When push comes shove, they're not. And quite frankly, you know, it, it's a, a shame on the industry and a sh shame on the developers, right, for not doing the diligence and homework. And on the flip side, kind of being sold a bill of goods. Um, but but that, frankly, that's that's why developers, it's very rare to see developers put meaningful amounts of their own capital work. And typically, the ones that have are the ones who get deals done. I would say, without a doubt, empirically, if we looked at every deal and transaction in the renewable fuel space, the ones who have the partner's development capital in it at the beginning, statistically, that has, I bet, 3x more likelihood of clearing the market, at least. Sir, you had a question there? Yeah. How much value do you need to optionality end to end of the chain? Optionality on the feedstock side, yeah. optionality on the destination markets? Okay. Uh, the answer is, it depends, right? You'll hear that a lot from me today. But the, the real answer is, what's your flexibility? So to your point, if you have a technology that is by design, has a wide range of feedstocks it can utilize, I'm going to think about a renewable diesel plant utilizing half a technology, for example. If you have a very robust pretreatment that allows for soybean oil, used cooking oil, silos corn oil, tallow, uh, canola oil, and the like. Because there's a wide range of your ability to access, I'm now less concerned about you locking it all up. If your feedstock requirement from a physical infrastructure technology standpoint requires one input, I'm very concerned. And all of a sudden, instead of maybe wanting 20%, I probably want close to 90, if not 100. Right? Because if that's the only feedstock you can run without that, you don't have any optionality. Okay. And same thing on the offtake, right? But that's interesting because more and more equity investors in particular are wanting projects to have secured offtake in place, which becomes challenging. Yeah, I struggle with that. And so what we're seeing a lot right now, and what we're advising our clients on, is going back to my offtake conversation, of what the firm does, is a lot of times we'll run an offtake process in parallel with the equity process. So then that way, and, and, and you know, later on diligence, we can bring two or three contracts to potential equity investors and say, hey, it, here's what the market's telling us. Here's what we're seeing. Here's the term. Here's the pricing. The, the developer is not going to execute on any of these until an equity partner is selected. But we need you to know that, that they are real about de-risking, and these are real contracts. That seems to be, frankly, the, the secret sauce that a lot of the investment community is liking because some of the investors will come back and say, I've, this is great, I love this, but you're planning on locking up 70% of your volumes. I really don't want any more than 50 because I want to I float the merchant. I That's think there's good. more upside in the long term. And opposed to other people, might say, you know, 70 is perfect. Let's execute that today. So that's the balance. Yeah, I'm trying to talk about flexibility. Yeah. It's a little bit of a way. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've experienced sort of these disruptions lately. Yeah. Of course, in the last four or five years, that could impact any. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to have a way out. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess this goes to the monitor slide. But it seems like LCFS credit prices have like weakened a lot. Is yeah. That what credit prices are people willing to underwrite now? And if it differs, <laughs> differs between, I guess, PE and strategics, and what what are they looking at now and willing to underwrite? What were they willing to underwrite six months, nine months ago before the bottom really fell out? Yeah. So that's a very interesting and very good question. So equity underwriting is different than debt. And I just want to mention that because debt will not underwrite. RINs or LCFS. And if they do, it's so offensive that you might as well not even do it. Equity typically has their own house feel. Every large strategic, every large infrastructure player, every large PE fund, they have their own proprietary view of RINs pricing and LCFS pricing. 
The first thing they do when you bring them an opportunity is they will put in those assumptions. They have their own base, their own bear, and their own bull. And getting at the heart of your question, typically the way the investment decision is made is they want to ensure that their target returns, let's just say it's 12.5%, is met at base, at their base view. But what most people don't appreciate is their bear view, their downside case on both of those markets. When they put that in, they want to make sure that your project is at or greater than their cost of capital. If that happens, they're willing to underwrite it. Assuming you solve for technology, blah, 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 blah. Right? But that's usually how they're thinking about it. So it depends on the project. right? And frankly, right now, uh, most people are using, I say most people, I would say it's very common to see an average over the next 10 years of $175 to $200 for LCFS. On a 10-year average, right, though, including inflation, which is drastically lower than where CAR thinks it should be. I think their 10-year average, you look at their four projections, like 350. So it's, it's low. And then most people are using about a $3 uh, T3 rent average, about a buck 50 uh, D4 and D5 average over a 10-year basis. Pretty common right now. Four, $4 to 450 natural gas on 10 years. Can you see the difference between the sponsors and strategics? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, sponsors always think, you know, it's up here. <laughs> Strategic, a lot more conservative. All those things down here. Bid ask is usually pretty high. I'm um, quite frankly, um, but I would say the difference between that is your, your your savvy sponsors. They know what's real, and they appreciate that, and they usually look at ways to de-risk that. And that's why a lot of these platforms now have a mix of voluntary versus merchant, right? And they want to try to find that sweet spot of that percentage. Uh, but yeah, typically. Your sponsors always are going to have a more bullish view, and your strategics are going to be much more conservative because that's just in their nature. So, so if you're underwriting the molecules in those price ranges you just said, one seventy-five to two hundred LCFS, three dollars for RENs, four dollars for MBTU, what is the price per molecule? What is the average price you're putting on a molecule? That, that was the average number I was saying for ten-year strip. Yeah, no, but combine those all up. What is? Oh, what does that mean for like an MBTU? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in that scenario, what I just threw out, so three dollars, that's thirty-five dollars an M. Uh, put in your CI score. Um, that could add another. That's probably all in, sir. Would be somewhere between sixty and eighty-five dollars M and B to you, depending on your what CI. Is your, score. What are you assuming CI score there? Well, that's that's the great question. Yeah. If you assumed it was negative, you'd be up on the eighty. If you assume it's a landfill, you're you're you would only get two to three dollars. Uh, per, per MMB to you. Right. So but you're at forty dollars. A relatively low CI yes, score at that price. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. So I know we're uh, getting getting short on time here. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, food waste. So um, I've been involved in trying to get you know food waste separation programs going. It seems very hard to get going <laughs> in this country if there's not a law. Um, if this is such a valuable commodity. Why is that so? And what could we do to change the dynamic on that? It's interesting. Um, it's a quagmire. Because if you had full adoption of food, uh, food diversion laws, mm -hmm. you actually would remove the long-term value uh, of landfill gas right, from this salt waste. So the vast majority of the methane that is produced within biogas is also of organic compounds that comes from food, decomposing into the landfill, so the bug seed. So that, that A is just an interesting, fun one, right? Like if you took all of it out and you put it in the food waste, that means you would actually reduce the RNG coming off of landfills, but you would increase it here. Net net, you'd probably be about the same. You could debate on all the other secondary tertiary benefits or not. Um, but from that, the reason that, frankly, it hasn't gotten more traction is the aggregation is so hard. You have to have what a lot of people call NFL cities. You have to have that volume of food waste for it to be enough feedstock on a continuing basis for it to be economic support to anaerobic digesters. Say New York City. Hmm? New York City. Yeah. New York City? Well, that probably has uh, some of the best opportunities for, for feed, food waste products. <coughs> that know. There's a handful of them that are in production right now and a handful more that are trying to be scheduled. Um, but again, it, it is, frankly, it, it's uh, it's... It's an aggregation game, and then it's thinking about it also in New York City, is you're having to truck that food waste so far to have a footprint for the plant, which 
is economically challenging and it hurts your CI. That's actually, if you think about it, an interesting, fun tidbit. The impact for a CI score for a food waste production facility that is co-located for an anaerobic digester next to the point of aggregation, as opposed to one that is 75 miles away, which is the average, that costs you about 70 CI points because of the diesel footprint of your trucks. So anyway, that's just a fun one. But it, to answer your question short, um, East Coast, there's a lot of food projects that are coming online. A lot of people are pursuing them. And we've looked at numerous in the last year for that exact reason. So I know we're short on time, and I uh, want to be respectful of that. But I just wanted to throw this up here. Apologies, it's a little small. But this was the case study. I hope we'd have the time to, to get to, and instead of breaking up and let everyone think through it, we'll just talk about it here and quickly kind of give you my, my opinions of things. I would hone in on it and let you all ask some questions and comments. So the question is, you have six opportunities. Which one do you recommend to your investment committee? Right? First one here, RNG Portfolio Company. They have a total of five assets, three operational, two B-developed projects. The two operational... The two of the operational and running projects have been operating for 18 months. The other one just came online. They are producing projected volumes of RNG, i.e. they're actually hitting what they said they would. They have a lump sum, turnkey, EPC contract executed for the three, or excuse me, for the, I messed up the number in there, the two, two people <coughs> assets. They have 100% merchant exposure, no fixed offtake. Right? They're looking to maintain control of the company, raise 100% of the capital to build out the next Comes to the projects, 100 million, want to maximize that for a payment. The next RNG opportunity is just the reverse. We have two operating assets, three to be developed, three to be developed. Those have also been running. They have EPC, but it's a time and materials contract. Where they have 50% merchant exposure and 50% voluntary. They're looking to raise more and also looking to maintain control of the capital. Which one of those? would be most likely to clear investment committee of average investors? There's really not a right or a wrong answer, to be quite frank. I brought this one up here and all of these to highlight very important considerations. The EPC, the time and materials, as soon as you see that, that assumes, that should tell you the debt, senior secured debt, your bank lenders, likely aren't going to be there. If they are, it's going to be expensive. Your EPC, you want some turn pre contract? Debt loves that. It's guaranteed. No risk. They know exactly how much they're in for. They will be there and they'll be there cheaper. The issue you're going to run into is in option one, even though debt loves the EPC because it lumps some, as I said earlier, they won't underwrite 100% merchant because the risk is, is unknown. And what is important when you think about this is debt will always want to make sure that they can cover the, the principal and interest. So if you haven't locked, locked up enough volumes to cover your principal and interest, debt will never show up. So that's why we typically advise clients the right way to think about this is what are your capital needs? And really what that means is how much you're willing to be diluted. Because equity will dilute you, debt will not. But if you want debt, you need offtake, which means you're giving up merchant. So that goes back to the question of how much you're willing to be diluted. Based upon that, you determine how much debt you need. Based upon that, you can reverse engineer how much offtake you need to lock up and at what price to bring in debt. Obviously, an investment grade counterparty is even better, which is part of the reason to talk about this down here with an RD and SAF opportunities. You notice here, this one is talking about 50% of the volumes been Ford sold to an airline on 10 years at index. This opportunity, only has 30% of volumes sold to oil and gas company at 10 years fixed price. Which one of those? Just knowing that two fact alone, everything we talk about, which one of those do you think is going to be much more attractive to an investor? Depends. It's going to be the, this one. All day. Fixed price. Index terrifies people. Also, oil and gas is an interesting concept there. Because most oil and gas companies are investment grade. They care about the credit worthiness of the off -day. Airlines, on the other hand, are junk status. There's not a single airline that is investment grade. So a lot of the SAF producers, going back to the balance we're talking about off -day, 
A lot of the developers come and say, I have an off-take agreement. Okay, that's great. Good. Airline X, oh, lovely. It's great. So no credit, check. Chuck status. And what's the pricing? Is it fixed? Oh, no, no, no. no they're going to buy it at index with Jet A. They're going to buy 100% of our volumes. We just got to produce it on time, at spec, and they're going to buy it at index. Oh, that's, that's, that's lovely. Debt will not even begin to act on that. And if debt doesn't act, that means equity has to front all of it, which they don't like that much risky. Unless it becomes a mandatory buy for the airline due to regulatory. Correct. But the mandatory buy for the airline will only set a floor. Yeah. Right? So the right way to, the, I think the best way to think about that is, is the market will balance to be at parity with the, the, uh, up the other cost, which would be a stick, right? We have a carrot program. Europe's about to incentivize a stick. That stick will determine exactly where the voluntary market settles. Right, because if if I own an airline company, my penalty is one hundred dollars per gallon. For example, well, why would I pay one hundred and one? I'll pay you ninety nine. That's one dollar better. So the question is, if a stick ever comes out, how big is that stick, and is it enough to underwrite? It's a good point. But these are some of the things that, are, that, that people think about and some of the trade-offs that need to be considered. The other thing that I wanted to point out here, as you think about everything we talked about, discuss right here. These economists rely on a low CI resulting from a CCS solution that's 250 miles of new pipe with a newly permitted class six well, specifically a to be permitted class six well. <laughs> At index. Uh, right? <laughs> Which means I just layered on two binary elements. I have to have the pipeline. It's built 250 miles in a long pipeline run. And I have to make sure that my class six well permanent occurs. Which, again, I'd say people won't take that risk, but it's binary on binary risk. Especially when you think about economics. Right? If that's predicated on this concept we talked about earlier, David, that the only way you're going to take this is if the CI score is X, and part of that is a CO2 solution. That's very concerning, because now I have three layers of binary risk. I have pipeline, I have class six, and I have my off-take that could possibly walk. I can tell you, if that was the structure, all of your, your smart money, Black Rocks, Black Stones, anyone you can think of, will say, have a good day. <coughs> and, and debt will not be there. Either. So that's a uh, very high level, some of the items. I know we're, we're bump, bumping up here on time. I wanted to give a few minutes for questions. We, we got in some good stuff, didn't get nearly as far into this as I thought we would, but hopefully this was helpful. Um, any, any general questions or, or outstanding items we haven't addressed that I could be of uh, insight for today? Sir? With the uh, kind of glut of funds entering this market, less this year, we're about 21, 22, how have you seen that changing deals? Have you seen deals that maybe otherwise shouldn't go through based on the economics going yep. through because Oakfield has a $30 billion fund in Um, Really good question. So what the gentleman's getting out is that a lot of these new funds are very strict <laughs> mandates by the limited partners. They have to deploy, or the funds can only be deployed into certain sectors, sub-sectors. Some of them say they have to be in energy transition, low-carb. Some of them are specific as saying it has to be in sustainable aviation. So all that depends. The answer is this is what happened. People got really excited. They looked at a lot. Then all of a sudden, the risk, the binary risk of you losing a billion dollars of your fund set in with all the partners. And now they've gotten back to the normal economic beast that they are. And so what that really means, and what's very interesting about that is most people also don't know this, is funds have a sudden set of the life, typically. right? So when you go out and you raise a $5 billion fund uh, on fund five of some vertical, that's $5 billion. Everyone thinks that's there in perpetuity. It's not. And if it's not deployed by a certain time, it goes back to the LPs. So what has really been interesting is what is, is happening right now is you have a ton of dry powder that has not been deployed. And so that's why there are very smart developers who have been pacing and been spending years developing solutions that are trying to take it to the market now. And I believe you will see a wave of projects in the next 18 months that get funded and reach final investment decision for that exact reason. Because developers 
who were very, very methodical will be able to provide a well-developed and de-risk solution to these funds. And by the way, these projects we're talking about, such as RD, SAT, hydrogen, ammonia, I mean, they all have a B on, on their handle, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about one plan, one and a half billion, up to three billion. These are big numbers. So there's going to be, we believe, a pretty meaningful injection of capital. Because going back to binary risk, these funds are going to be forced to ask themselves a question. And this is called 18 months when the fund sunsets. It's no longer a question of, do I like this asset? It's going to be a question of, have I seen anything better than this asset come to the market? Do I think there will be anything better? And if the answer to that is no, can I get comfortable with this risk? Because if that answer is yes, I, again, believe in pragmatic realism. Most of your fund managers are going to employ that capital so they maintain the management fee. That's how this will work. Yeah. Well, that, interest, that opens up an interesting wrinkle. Something we talk about a lot, which is uh, smart money going after bad projects, which is quite frankly, going back to my comment, that we are very, very selective about the deals we bring to the investor universe. The worst thing that could happen for the energy transition is smart money and good money is deployed on bad projects. Because when these funds who can deploy billions and actually support this industry, if they lose a billion dollars on their first opportunity, their return threshold and risk just went up to here. So now all of a sudden you just cut out that many more projects from all the them. So it's critical that this first wave of renewable fuels is critical to this first wave of really just going to be coming out of the IRA in the next 18 months. That is good projects that are consuming good capital. It could be nothing worse than for the industry, financial industry, and energy transition than bad projects to take that good capital. That will hurt everyone.